You know, thank you so much, Jim. I, I've known you for about 10 years, and you know, they say there is no such thing as a crystal ball, but I recall that in the discussions leading up to the royalty review, you were definitely one of the ones who had the courage to say, warning, warning, red flag, this is, this is headed in a bad direction. So I hope, um, I hope that the warnings that you are giving right now are heeded, are heeded more. I really believe that uh, what we're doing here today is planting the seeds of ideas and therefore I very much appreciate the time that you have shared here with us today. And we know that the people in this room and also those who are going to hear your message on YouTube and iTunes have the influence and networks to help them take your ideas and help them grow. So thank you for your investment here in Alberta and Canada's future. I think you may have already gotten a copy of this from me, but to all of our speakers today, we're giving copies of um, Steve Jobs' biography by Walter Isaacson. Walter is coming to speak to us here at our Bomba Book Club dinner um, in a few weeks. And the reason why I think this book is so important is that it really shows an example of somebody who thinks differently and who thinks courageously and who really makes things happen. So I thought that was a good reflection for our speakers today. So thank you to Jim. So I'm, I'm absolutely delighted now to be introducing uh, Gord Kerr to you. Um, you know, we had quite a fun conversation uh, on the phone when we were talking about this event and, um, you know, Gord really has been a tremendous asset to Calgary and to Alberta through the work that he's done with Enter Plus. Um, you know, being involved there since 1996, but also taking the time outside of, you know, the, the business that he was in to be the chairman of CAP and be involved in so many other organizations and projects uh, to really tell the story here. What I really admire about Gord is that he is uh, outspoken in his passion for driving more business to Calgary and to Alberta. So please join me in welcoming Gord Kirk. a little high. It's the shoes. <laughs> Everybody hear me okay? Well great. Well thank you for inviting me here today uh, and as uh, Jim alluded to uh, today's a very special day here in, in Calgary. Uh, and so right after this I'm actually going to be leaving to join my wife who was a uh, former city alderman to uh, pay tribute to Ralph and also uh, with respect to his family and my wife spent a fair bit of time not just working with Ralph as the premier of the province but also with his son Brad who was a member uh, of actually one of the community associations that uh, she dealt with. So the title here is uh, Boring Can Be Better, How Certainty Supports Risk and you're probably finding it very difficult to comprehend how an accountant addresses a topic with boring in the title. <laughs> what I want to do is I want to share a few experiences that I've had that I think will relate to the topic. And for those of you who are not familiar with Enterplus, Enterplus was the first oil and gas trust established in Canada back in 1986. So we have well over a 25 year history in the oil and gas business here in Western Canada. Uh, we've since converted into a corporation, uh, which of course was stimulated by some uh, political activities, and I'll touch on that. <laughs> so it's November 23rd, 2005. The Liberals are in power, and a federal election has been called. A key topic in the campaigns had been the taxation of income trusts. There was a lot of discussion taking place that the Liberals were contemplating introducing a tax on the trusts. They had actually implemented a public consultation process. And there was a lot of pushback on the idea of taxing the trusts. The Conservatives were adamant they were not going to introduce a tax on the trusts. So again, it's November 23rd, 2005. Ralph Goodale, the Minister of Finance, has made an announcement in respect of the matter. And shortly following the Finance Minister's announcement, 
John McKay, the parliamentary secretary to the finance minister, and Monty Solberg, the conservative finance critic, are being interviewed on TV side by side. The interviewer effectively asked John the question, what do you think about the minister's announcement in respect of the taxation of trusts? John responds something to the effect, well, it's only a small rate of tax. At that point, Monty looks at John and essentially says, what are you talking about? The minister said there wouldn't be a tax imposed on the trusts. So I suspect, and this is purely thoughtful conjecture on my part, the minister went with plan B and John didn't get the update and thought they were going with plan A. So on January 23rd, 2006, the Conservatives defeated the Liberals, forming a minority government, and Stephen Harper became the 22nd Prime Minister of Canada. Now as we went into the fall of 2006, the market capitalization of trusts in Canada had grown to billions of dollars, a significant component of which was held in the portfolio of retail investors. The energy sector of this structure alone represented over 90 billion of market capitalization. And I remember we received a call in September of 2006 from a fund manager who was looking to invest some of the recently raised funds, but had questions, including one as to whether or not we had any concerns around the federal government changing the rules. Now, all we could do was advise of the Conservatives' position leading up to the election. I believe they invested a good chunk of their fund into oil and gas trusts at that time. On October 31st, 2006, Halloween, 281 days after they were elected, the Conservative government announced they were planning to propose legislation that would impose a tax on trusts. Investors lost billions virtually the next day and no heads up. And I remember one MP who shall remain nameless. So what did you expect us to do? Uh, well, Maybe keep your promise? <laughs> so we formed the Coalition of Canadian Energy Trusts to try and get the Feds to rethink that decision, particularly with respect to our sector. We were bringing capital in from investors looking for something better than a GIC, bridging on a symbiotic basis with both junior and senior companies relative to the deployment of capital, and extracting value out of mature oil and gas assets that would not otherwise see the light of day. I spent a fair bit of my time together with the likes of John Dealworth from Arc Energy Trust at the time, Susan, Sue Riddell Rose, uh, Dave Middleton from Penn West, uh, trying to hold a lot of conversations. And I gotta tell you, we had conversations with political MPs of all stripes. But let me just digress to one little story. And uh, it was with respect to an NDP candidate that we were supposed to meet and see. And we were left waiting in the outer office for 45 minutes. And finally, and her assistant had come out, interesting character. Uh, okay, it was an NDP MP. <laughs> And uh, he assured us that the, minister, that the uh, MP was going to meet with us. And uh, after 45 minutes, uh, she came out, might start to create some specificity around the who, and said, uh, well, listen, uh, I've only got five minutes here uh, because I've got an interview and I know everything there is to know about trust. Really? I was absolutely flabbergasted. And she said, but you can stay and you can talk to my assistant, Chuck. Poor Chuck. He looked like a deer in the headlights. 
And I said to him, and Sue, uh, Sue will remember this, it's your lucky day because I'm going to tell you some of the things you don't know. And it probably won't go past you, but I need to say this. And so I vented a little bit with poor Chuck for a bit. Well, forget all the effort that we went through. We did a lot of analysis. We were supported in many, many ways by a number of, uh, of uh, analysts out in the community and some very uh, uh, significant analysis was done to, in support of the business model and relative to uh, the, uh, what we were doing as a business. Forget all of that effort. My take is that the feds didn't want to perform selected surgery with the exception of the REITs and had already decided Let's just do away with the beast. End of experience one. Now shortly after that, here in our backyard, the Alberta government decided that they would have a review done in respect of oil and gas and tax regimes. A panel was formed in February of 2007 to conduct the review and come back with a report. Now, as a side note, I don't believe any of the panel members had ever had full responsibility for running an oil and gas company. The consultative process was run starting in April, and in the fall, and maybe fall has a lot to do with it relative to timing and also maybe a little bit of a subtle message, but in the fall of 2007, the report of the panel was provided to the government. And shortly thereafter, and I mean shortly, I think within a matter of hours, it was released publicly. At the time, I was the chairman of CAP, in addition to my responsibilities and duties as the uh, president and CEO of Enterplus. And I remember when I read the report, as the chairman of CAP and as the CEO of Enterplus, I almost fell out of my chair. I remember thinking, where's a fulsome analysis of the, the risk of investing in oil and gas, the discussion of capital markets, the implications for other elements and business in our community, the impact of lease purchase revenues, land being the precursor to future capital spending. Where is it? Well, Jim has already covered many of the details and outcomes with respect to the new royalty framework work that was put forward, including impacts in the capital markets and decisions of oil and gas companies with respect to capital spending in the province. And of course, subsequent to that, there was a lot of backtracking done to really, in effect, step away from that, uh, from that uh, new framework. But there was an integrity issue created as a consequence of that, and capital moved out of and away from the province. In fact, uh, we made one of our biggest investments in our history outside of the province of Alberta, and I remember in the conference call, was jurisdiction a key factor? And my response was, not really, but it's helpful. <laughs> and one, one other small uh, a side note I want to make. In both of these experiences, the governments weaved in the wording of fair share. And I remember the comments of Eve Fortin at the hearings of the Federal Finance Committee where I represented the, uh, the oil and gas trusts in respect of the trust tax. And Eve is a well-respected economist who has had a distinguished career, including time in the Canadian Department of Finance. In fact, I recall in a meeting with uh, Jim Prentice, I mentioned this report that uh, Yves Forte, Fortin had written. And he said, I've got time for that guy, basically, and I will read that report. Anyway, Eve's comment was to the effect that as soon as you wor use words like fair share in the dialogue, you've tilted the playing field. So a little side personal note. I play hockey with a group of guys on Friday nights, at least I try to get out on a regular basis with them. And it was absolutely surprising to me. I'm in the dressing room, we're getting ready, and this one gent who's a, who's a lawyer turned teacher, I won't get too specific, he knows who he is. He looked at me and he says, yeah, 
I want my fair share. I want to look big oil in the eye. And I looked back at him and said, well, you're looking at it. We almost got into it in the dressing room, for God's sake. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> then we both realized that we're a lot older and we're more fragile and we shouldn't really take it out on the ice because it's non-contact. But what, I really, what really surprised me was how divisive that whole exercise put forward by the government in looking at the Royal Review, how divisive it was within our province. And I, and I remember, you know, in terms of this industry is, is amazing. We've heard a lot about it. We heard, heard from Rex Murphy this morning in terms of how important it is, not just to Alberta, but to Canada as, as a country. And this, this lack of understanding of what the contribution was, not just in the sense of the energy, but the other spin-off business and the career paths that you can take. I actually did a panel discussion at the uh, Husking School of Business, and afterwards we went for dinner with a group of the, uh, the, the uh, associate deans in there, and also uh, uh, the president of the uh, MBA school, or the uh, student association. And at one point I asked her, so what do you think about the oil and gas business? And she said, well, I don't know. I, I guess I don't really have a good opinion of it. And I said, well, do you know what the contribution is to the provincial revenue purse out of oil and gas revenue in this province? No. And I said, well, let me just give you, and it was 2005 kind of time frame. And the contribution directly from oil and gas revenues was roughly $14 billion. Three billion of which came from land sales. One billion, roughly, from oil sands. One billion from conventional oil. And nine billion from natural gas royalty streams. $14 billion out of a $34 billion revenue stream directly attributable to the oil and gas business. I said, you know, given that you're here studying this, you know, studying in Alberta, and the government is providing funding to our educational institutions, you might want to think a bit more about that. And in fact, if you have any kind of a negative, you might want to think about, well, how do I make it better? And so that just left a, a great impression, not a great impression in the sense of a positive, but in terms of even in our own backyard, the understanding of what our industry brings to all of this. So what is the key in all of this from my, my uh, perspective? You know, Canada is a resource-rich nation. Everybody understands that. We're rich in natural resources. We're rich in talented people. We're rich in entrepreneurship and we're vast in aerial extent. We're a population of 35 million people with the majority of us living in relative proximity to the 49th parallel, and what I affectionately refer to as the thin red line. And to realize the ben benefits of that richness, we need capital. And we cannot take capital for granted just because we have the resources. It, uh, at an IHS Herald uh, conference a few years ago in, in Connecticut, I recall a chart that was put up showing the risk returns for oil and gas investment in various jurisdictions across the globe. And Canada was at the low end of the return. Capital is highly mobile. Jim talked about this as well. And will go to where it can earn the best return, taking risk into account. We've seen this happen. So why would someone invest in Canadian oil and gas? Lower risk, certainty of policy, of honoring contact, contracts, of tax regimes, of regulation. When you know the rules, and they're not going to change dramatically, then you're more willing to play the game. So when you're going to change the rules, be very mindful of how it will affect the inflow of capital, because we need it. And if that's boring, then it can be good. So thank you for your time.